Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. I've done quite a few videos so far covering various aspects of the Apollo moon landings and no surprises, I've received many comments from people who don't believe it happened. But a few of them have been around the same general topics about the speed of the Apollo spacecrafts and the fuel required for those speeds. Comments along the lines of, if they were travelling at 24,000 miles an hour and the moon is 250,000 miles away, then it should have only taken them 10 hours to get there, not 3 days. Or, how did they have enough fuel to get up to 24,000 miles an hour to fly to the moon, then slow down to land on the moon, then take back off and reach 24,000 miles an hour again because that was the speed that they re-entered Earth's atmosphere. Much of this is just people misunderstanding how spaceflight works, so in this video I'm going to try and clear up the misconceptions about the Apollo missions, and as always I will try and keep it as simple as I can to follow, although this is quite literally rocket science. Mind you, if Brilliant.org's rocket physics class can do it, then I'm sure I can too. If you haven't heard of Brilliant.org before, it is a fantastic way to learn. With hundreds of classes across maths, science and computing, each class breaks down the concepts of topics whilst quizzing you on them, made all the easier to understand thanks to their helpful and interactive animations, and can offer you hints as you go. You can also push yourself with their daily streak by answering three questions per day. It's been a while since I've talked about Brilliant in my videos, but my streak continues and at the time of me filming this, I'm on 260 continuous days. They've also recently added a good feature called Streak Charge, which lets you answer extra questions to store up an extra life so that if you end up missing a day for some reason, you won't lose your streak. For anyone interested in expanding their knowledge, I highly recommend grabbing yourself a 30-day free trial by visiting brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and the first 200 people to do so can get 20% off an annual subscription. Now, if we place a cannon on Earth that is level to your local position, that means it's tangential to the globe. If we then remove air resistance and gravity from the equation, once the projectile leaves the cannon, there would no longer be any force acting upon it, and so as per Newton's law of motion, it would travel at a constant speed in a straight line along that tangent and ultimately off into space. Now, if we add gravity back into the mix, or whatever flat earthers want to call it that causes objects to accelerate towards the Earth, once that projectile leaves the cannon, it would now have a force acting on it, causing it to drop towards the ground. But the rate that it accelerates to the ground is constant, so the faster that we make the projectile as it leaves the cannon, the further it will have travelled before it falls to the ground. Now, as the Earth is curving, that means that if we get the projectile speed just right, it will be covering the ground at the right rate that the curve of Earth cancels out the rate that the object is being pulled towards the ground, and thus the object will wind up staying the same height above Earth basically in a constant freefall, aka an orbit. But if we were to make that projectile move a bit faster, then that would mean it would be covering the ground at a quicker rate than the ground is curving away, and so the altitude to Earth would be increasing, but it wouldn't disappear off into space because Earth's gravity would constantly be acting on it, slowing it down. Meaning the craft speed moving away from Earth will ultimately reach zero. This point is known as the apoapsis of its orbit. Now, as energy can't be created or destroyed, then what was the kinetic energy of it moving away when it stops will now become gravitational potential energy and it will begin accelerating back towards the Earth. And with no air resistance to slow it down, it will fly right back around to where it started from. So ultimately, the further away from Earth that we want an object to reach means that that object requires more kinetic energy to overcome the constant pull from gravity, at least until it's far enough away that the effect of Earth's gravity becomes negligible. Now that could be the object getting all of the kinetic energy in one go, like firing a cannon, it could be short bursts of energy in intervals, or it could be one long continuous stream of energy similar to a car engine overcoming air resistance. So let's say we want to get to the moon, but for simplicity for the moment, let's say that the moon is stationary and it doesn't have any gravity of its own. For a spacecraft to reach the moon, it needs enough kinetic energy that the apoapsis of the orbit will be at least as far as the moon. 
You could put it well beyond the moon, but then that would mean you need more energy to begin with, and then if you then didn't scrub the speed off when you got near the moon, you'd go sailing by. So for energy efficiency, you want the apoapsis of the orbit to just reach the moon. So the spacecraft would need a huge burst of speed to begin with to overcome the fact that from that moment on, it would be constantly slowing down due to Earth's gravity pulling it back. Kind of like if you imagine driving a car along a very long road and you want to stop at a particular point in the distance. But rather than cruising steadily up to it with the engine pushing you all the way down the road, you instead are going to build up a huge amount of speed, then drop the car into neutral and just freewheel to a stop. You'll accelerate up to a really fast speed, but as soon as you put the car into neutral, that speed will steadily start scrubbing off. However, now let's factor in that the moon has its own gravitational pull. Although the moon is much smaller than Earth, so its gravitational pull is only about one-sixth of ours. Now, the Earth's gravity still has an impact on objects near the moon, and the moon's gravity has an impact on objects near the Earth. Just take tides, for example. So, the spacecraft setting off from Earth would actually have the moon's gravity trying to pull it towards the moon, but the Earth's gravity will be much more prominent because it's both larger and much closer. As the craft gets further from Earth, the gravitational pull from Earth weakens, and as the craft gets closer to the moon, the moon's gravitational pull will increase, meaning there will be a crossover point where the gravitational pull of the moon surpasses that of the Earth. Now let's factor in that the moon isn't actually stationary, it's constantly moving, meaning the spacecraft doesn't fly an orbit aiming directly for the moon, it instead flies an orbit that is aiming for where the moon is going to be when the spacecraft reaches the right distance away from Earth. So that addresses why journey times don't match what some people expect. Apollo craft required a speed of 24,000 miles an hour to have their orbit reach out far enough to intersect the moon's gravity, but from the moment that that speed was reached, it was pretty much always slowing down after that. It wasn't doing 24,000 miles an hour all the way to the moon, which is why it took much longer than 10 hours to get there. For example, Apollo 11's velocity after its burn to the moon was finished was 34,195 feet per second. 30 hours later, they'd reached a distance from Earth of 125,000 miles, but its velocity had slowed right down to 4,486 feet per second, which is just over 3,000 miles an hour, with still 100,000 miles left to go. As such, they didn't reach lunar orbit for almost another two full days. To address the question of how did they have enough fuel to get to that speed to get to the moon, the bulk of the thrust getting to the moon did not actually come from the command service module. It instead came from the much larger S4B stage. The first and second stages of the Saturn V would do the bulk of the heavy lifting to get the astronauts into space. The first stage burnt for just under three minutes to get the craft up through the thick atmosphere, up to the edge of space at an altitude of about 62 miles, but only about 175 miles downrange of the launch site. The second stage would then burn for over six minutes, raising its altitude by another 40 miles, but more importantly, increasing its velocity from 5,300 miles an hour all the way up to 14,500 miles an hour. The S-4B would then take over, burning for a little over two minutes to get the velocity up to 16,500 miles an hour needed to stay in orbit. At the right time then, about two and a half hours later, the S-4B would reignite for the trans-lunar injection burn, increasing the velocity to over 23,000 miles an hour to raise the apoapsis to reach the moon. After this translunar injection burn was when the command and lunar modules would dock together and the S-4B stage was discarded. So they were already en route to the moon before the command module engine ever became usable. Throughout most of the journey to the moon, the velocity of the spacecraft would be gradually slowing down. However, as it got near the moon and the moon's gravitational pull started to overcome that of Earth the velocity of the spacecraft would actually start to increase due to that gravitational pull. So as the craft flies by the moon, its velocity relative to the moon would be too fast for the moon's gravity alone to capture it into an orbit. Apollo was traveling at around 8,300 feet per second, which is about 5,600 miles an hour, as it got to the moon. 
So as they reached the backside of the moon, they performed what was called an orbital insertion burn, whereby they ignited the service module's SPS engine, which had about 20,000 pounds of thrust, and did a six-minute burn to slow themselves down by around 3,000 feet per second to 5,300 feet per second, which is 3,600 miles an hour. This kept them within a sustained lunar orbit at an altitude of about 70 miles above the surface. Now, some people have queried about the lunar module having to go from that orbital speed of 3,600 miles an hour to stopped on the surface and then back up to orbit again. Well, bear in mind, the lunar module was in two parts. It had a total mass of around 15,000 kilos. The descent stage had a mass of just over 10,000 kilos, of which 8,200 kilos of that was propellant. Here are some diagrams showing a breakdown of the lunar module. The descent stage had two fuel tanks and two oxidizer tanks, all for the engine alone. And you can see that these are pretty much most of the height of the descent stage. Now, compare this with a view of a person standing next to said descent stage, and you get a pretty good idea of just how large those fuel tanks were. So they had plenty of fuel on board. In fact, most of the weight of the lunar module was propellant, and obviously... As they're burning through that fuel, the mass is then decreasing, which makes it easier for them to slow down. And as the moon's gravity is only one-sixth of that of Earth, then the descent rate of it being pulled down towards the moon is much less than what we would experience here. So not as much fuel would be required for a descent to the moon as it would for, say, on Earth. Then, for getting back up off the lunar surface, the descent stage was completely left behind. Only the ascent stage left the moon. This had a mass of 4,800 kilos at liftoff, of which almost half of that was fuel, again stored in rather large tanks either side of the craft. And the ascent engine, whilst not as powerful as the descent engine, was still able to produce 3,500 pounds of thrust. This was used to accelerate the lunar module up to 70 miles altitude and the 3,600 mile an hour orbiting speed to match that of the command module. Now, many people will question the plausibility of that, thinking, how can such a relatively small craft get to that height and speed? Well, for comparison, whilst the lunar module's ascent stage had a mass at liftoff of 4,800 kilos, the takeoff weight of an SR-71 Blackbird was 63,000 kilos, which is 13 times more. The SR-71's engines produced 18 times more thrust and burnt through 18,000 kilos of fuel per hour. That thing could get from a standing start on the runway up to 2,200 miles an hour at 80,000 feet within 20 minutes, whilst flying within our atmosphere. So the lunar module had less mass to move, no air resistance to overcome, and was only fighting against one-sixth of Earth's gravity. So not really that implausible compared to an SR-71, getting 13 times more mass to an altitude of 13 miles and two-thirds of Apollo's speed whilst fighting constant air resistance and six times stronger gravity. Once the lunar module was back in orbit, docked with the command module and the crew transferred, it was then discarded before the command module conducted its trans-Earth injection burn to head home. The command service module had a mass of just under 29,000 kilos at launch, now, minus the mass of the fuel that it had burnt slowing down for the moon in the first place, and now without the 15,000 kilos of lunar modules stuck to it, meant they had much less mass to accelerate on the return journey. But people have asked, how could the command module still have enough fuel to accelerate up to 24,000 miles an hour to get back to Earth? The simple answer is it didn't. The Apollo spacecraft might have re-entered the Earth's atmosphere at over 24,000 miles an hour, but that is not the speed needed to get back to Earth. Consider this as the inverse of the outbound journey. The outbound journey needed to get clear of the Earth's large gravitational influence and close enough to the Moon's small gravitational influence, so they needed a very large velocity to achieve that. Returning to Earth, though, they were being drawn in by Earth's gravity rather than constantly fighting against it. So they only needed the speed to get clear of the moon's gravity and enough into Earth's gravity that it would draw them back. As an analogy, if you consider the idea that we covered earlier of trying to freewheel a car over a particular distance, getting to the moon is like trying to freewheel a car up a slight incline with gravity constantly trying to drag you back down. 
Getting back to Earth is like going down that incline. You only need enough speed to get you going in the first place, and you'll be going much faster by the time you reach the end. So the trans-Earth injection burn was about a three-minute burn of the SPS engine, which increased their velocity by 3,200 feet per second, or 2,200 miles an hour. Again, after the initial burn, that velocity would begin to slow down as the moon's gravity acted upon them. However, once they were clear of that, the Earth's gravity would become more prominent and would be accelerating them back towards Earth with them reaching a peak speed of around 24,500 miles an hour just before they re-entered the atmosphere. But they didn't require much fuel to achieve that because gravity was doing most of the legwork. So that's going to be it for this video. Hopefully that has helped clear up some of the misconceptions for people. Thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.